By the year 2050, Great Britain will be a third world country. 50% of the people will be so fat that they can't even walk. And about 90% of the population in the schools will be uh, drug taking. And 2050 will see the end of the word great in front of Britain. That's me, 24-year-old documentary filmmaker Alex Vero, and I was going to see if I had what it took to become an international marathon runner. 20 years ago, when the running boom was at its height, we had something like 180 people under 2 hours 20 in Britain. You think of all the top marathon runners we had in this country in the old days, Ed Cox, Kilby, well, you can go on and Ron Hill, go way, way back, you know, uh, Steve Jones. So it's just a switch to, you know, to the new world, you know. Uh, we, we haven't got hungry people anymore, youngsters coming up. British male distance running had declined massively over the last 20 years, and our runners were no longer competing with the East Africans, who now dominated the sport. Was this down to a lack of talent in the UK, or were people simply no longer prepared to put in the training? If hundreds of people in the UK were running under two hours, 20 minutes for a marathon 20 years ago, then why couldn't I? As a 16 stone asthmatic smoker and heavy drinker, the idea of becoming an international marathon runner might have seemed absurd, but over the next two years, I decided to put myself through the rigors of training to better understand this decline in British male marathon running. The concept behind the project came about from a desire to change my life. I had spent much of the last six years in the pub and was sick of it, but now, finally, I was determined to do something about it. But this challenge would not be about losing weight or getting fit, but about how fast I could run over the marathon's 26.2 miles. If I could run under two hours, 20 minutes at the London Marathon in 2008, then amazingly, it might even put me in contention to qualify for the Beijing Olympics. The only problem was that I'd never been any good at running and had often finished last in the school cross country and at the time could only run for five minutes before having to stop. I had run the London Marathon before, but would need to knock over two hours from my first attempt to have any chance of qualifying. So was the idea of qualifying for the Olympics just a wild fantasy, or was it really possible? I think the chances of making it happen, there are probably 10,000 runners in the UK who are probably of a similar standard to you, and the question is, can you reduce those odds from 1 in 10,000 down to 1 in 25 and I question whether you're naturally gifted enough to be able to get as good as that. It's New Year's Day 2006 now and I woke up today feeling awful even though at the moment I'm probably around 16 miles a day. I really am looking forward to this challenge. I've got a huge, huge way to go, but I think with the right attitude and determination, I can really make this happen. If I was going to become an elite marathon runner, then I would need to start thinking like one and would need to completely change my lifestyle and leave the drinking behind. I had little idea of what I was getting myself in for, but I tied up my trainers and off I went. We're halfway around now. It's, it's uh, struggling a little bit. I'll be able to pee a little bit more. For him to even contemplating this, you know, you have to be strong, and and a lot of people are going to criticise you. And it's it's up to people to to support him on this on this challenge. He needs to put in at least 20 hours a week of, of training. I have no idea how much that burns your lungs. <laughs> I think, to be honest, you'll, you'll get to a stage where you kind of you kind of flat out, as it were. Being in a place like this just inspires you so much. I mean, it really brings back why I first started to run. If you put the effort in, you'll get the results, I reckon. I mean, at the moment, you're, you're far too healthy for, for a marathon running. You should be very much skinnier and much more gaunt. You look far too healthy. Because when people say, I'm all right, <laughs> You know, you know you're getting fit. Three, two, one, go. This is going to make him realise that uh, 
obviously he's got some work to do because he's not achieving what we set out to do. 65! Nine done. Six to go. I'm starting to hurt. 70, Alex. 71, 72, good, good, good. That's his 15th 400 and he did it in 72 seconds. I'm really, really proud of him. Over the first six months of the project, I made steady progress in training and lost over two stone in weight. But how far would a combination of weight loss and hard work get me? A physiological test would give a good indication of my natural talent and how far I might hope to progress over the next two years. I think realistically around about 240, between 230 and 245. I think you will get to a stage where you, you won't be able to improve a great deal more and if you look at our elite performers what you'll see is that they spend months and months training to improve by a couple of seconds here and there so clearly the, the improvement gets becomes less and less as, as you, your performance improves. So, but, but I think you've got a way to go yeah, before you, you start to plateau. According to the test results, it was unlikely that I had the natural talent to run under two hours, 20 minutes. But could these predictions be altered through two years of intense training? By now, the documentary was starting to attract attention and after talks with potential investors, I managed to put in place £40,000 of investment to expand the documentary, to follow other stories of runners, and to train myself as a full-time athlete over the next 16 months. But this had one condition, that I ran under two hours, 45 minutes at the Palmer Marathon in only six weeks' time. But could I actually run this fast over the marathon, having only been able to run for five minutes at a time 10 months earlier? With a marathon, you've got to take the emotion out of it. You've got to go to work. And when you go to work, you worry about you. You worry about what your body's doing, what pace you're doing, what your hydration you're taking on, what nutrition you're taking on. You know exactly what you're doing. And you want to run two seconds or even one second under 245. That's all you have to do. You don't have to get carried away and think, whoa, this is wonderful, I'm world champion. I can run sub 240 now. Forget it. One second under 245, take the dosh and then go away and start the next progression because you can't cheat it. With vast sums of potential investment came the burden of pressure and the fear of failure. 26.2 miles was all that stood in the way of an amount that could change the course of my life forever. Everything over the last 10 months has been building this moment, but I now knew that I was ready. The first few miles of the race flew by and I felt great. By halfway, I was already a minute ahead of schedule. With only six miles to go and in fifth place, I picked up the pace. I had run this distance a hundred times in training and was determined to finish the race some way below my target. But the marathon has a fearsome reputation for a reason. With two miles to go, the temperature had hit 30 degrees and I started to suffer the first signs of heat stroke. I had run 24 miles in two and a half hours. The last 2.2 miles would take a further 28 minutes. Finito. Finito. No. 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 I did eventually finish the race, but the investment was lost and I felt devastated. I'd failed to listen to Keith Anderson's advice and had paid the price for being overambitious. Oh dear. That's horrendous. I hit the wall so badly. Falling at the first hurdle, although, although it hurts, it's, uh, it really focuses the mind on what needs to be achieved in the future. He hasn't given up at all. In fact, it's actually 
It's actually inspired him even more because he's, he's, he's extremely determined now. I might have experienced firsthand why so few people were prepared to run competitive marathons in the UK. Sport of marathon running. Dr. Ron Hill, who had run every day for 47 years, had won gold at the 1960s Commonwealth Games Marathon and had become a national hero overnight. But like many runners from his generation, he had become increasingly exasperated by the exodus away from the sport he was so passionate about. You have to improve the status of a runner, because right now, you know, you can run in a big race and you pick up the newspaper, the results aren't even in there. So what does the guy feel like? I'm a nobody. Nobody's appreciating it. Nobody thinks you are anybody. You know, when I won my first marathon in 1961, it felt like hell at the end. I ran 2.24.22. Somebody gave me a lift back into Manchester. They actually propped me up against a bus stop because I couldn't move my legs. And I thought, never again. But, you know, I picked up the Guardian the next day and it was, oh, Ron Hill, this Ron Hill. I thought, my chest puffed out. I thought, bloody hell, I am somebody. I might look at this again. You don't, you haven't got that now. If a number of Britain's most successful distance runners thought that becoming an elite marathon runner was a pointless occupation, then what hope is there for future generations of British runners? The social status of elite marathon running had faded considerably since the 80s and was now fading to attract people to the sport. After a year of training, I was starting to understand why. It takes so much out of you, both mentally and physically, uh, that, that sometimes you don't even know what the hell is going on. Why I, why I put myself through this, uh, I sometimes don't know. It, it doesn't ever stop. It's 24 hours a day, I sleep, think, eat, drink this uh, whole project. And it's exhausting, but I think it's worth it. On 15, 23, about 23 seconds slow. It's pretty good, I had a really rough patch, about seven miles. Completely dropped off the pace. Uh, I got back on it. I was pretty pleased to finish. Uh, well done, Darren. 220 is going to be very hard to get below, I think. 215, extremely hard. The guys on 215 have been training for 10, 15 years. The training was always tough, but at the time this was the least of my concerns, as the exposure for the project had stirred up a hornet's nest of angry runners. The project has sparked a healthy debate over the question of nature versus nurture, but a sizeable portion of the running community didn't take too well to what I was trying to achieve with my own running, or by highlighting the decline in British distance running. A stream of internet abuse followed, as these runners felt that I was in some way undermining the sport. But for every negative one, there are a hundred more in support. During the time when I thought long and hard about giving up the project, the biggest motivating factor for continuing was the abuse that I had received. And in many ways, I'd like to actually thank the people who, who have criticised me throughout this whole project, because without you, I, I probably would have given up. So in some small way, uh, you, you've actually aided me, which, uh, which is rather amusing. The final big test before the London Marathon would be the Amsterdam Half Marathon in October. The training over the last year since the Palmer Marathon had been brutal. I'd lost four stone in weight, but running 100 miles a week in training was starting to take a toll on my body and my social life had all but disappeared. I'd spent two months out over the summer with a hip injury, but had come back to full fitness and ran the race of my life, finishing in an hour 13 minutes. Projected on the grounds that he was too poor to travel. Frustratingly, I would need to head back to the UK to gain support for his visa to be overturned. But before leaving, I assured Mengistu that he would get his chance to race abroad. Well done, Ben. Well done, Ben. While I'd been in Ethiopia, Ben had run the fourth fastest time of the year for a half marathon and was now gearing his training to the English Half Marathon Championships in Bristol as part of his build up to his marathon debut at the Amsterdam Marathon in October. Well Hello, done, mate. Ben. Awesome. Well good. done, fella. Is go. that your quickest? Yeah. Good lad. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, Ben, some fabulous half marathons and marathons ahead of you over the next however many years. It's just a case of how you look after yourself, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. <laughs> it really is.
and whether you get that waterproof out of the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a real shame. You can run eight times a mile. Run eight times a mile. Do you want some out there, bro? I shouldn't take the dick out of you at this stage. You've worked far too hard for your coach to take the piss at this stage. <laughs> The Bristol Half Marathon would be the perfect opportunity for Mengus 2 to race against the best British runners and would give me just enough time to gain the necessary support for his visa. A lot had happened over the last few months, but with 10 weeks to go before the London Marathon, I needed to refocus my efforts towards my training as it entered the final stages. I think I predicted that you'd run 2.40 maybe for the marathon and the sort of um, performances that you're producing now and, and the, the data suggests that you'll probably run sub 230. So I think you've done phenomenally well for someone who came in really um, with this almost a pipe dream and um, you know has, has gone ahead and, and really tried to carry it through. Two hours, 27 minutes was now the revised target. It would not be good enough to qualify me for the Beijing Olympics, but it could potentially place me inside the top 15 runners in the country. That training at altitude has made things like this seem so much easier. It's really starting to pay off. 14 weeks of hard training. It's about time I reap the benefits. I've been having problems with an Achilles heel injury that I'd picked up in Ethiopia, and although still training hard, the pain was becoming increasingly unbearable, even with the use of high dosage painkillers. I needed to get some expert advice, and after an MRI scan, Dr. Mike Bundy gave the diagnosis. How am I going to be able to actually race in six weeks' time? I think it's is it like, stupid? Yeah, I think so. I think what I quite like to do, though, is is to sort of offload it and improve it with an injection. I think in six weeks' time, if you said I have to run two miles, you could run. I don't think that'll be a problem, but it's unrealistic being able to run a marathon. And it's it was. I just could not believe it. I've been able to train for 108 weeks and only needed to do another six. A small tear in my left Achilles heel triggered by a small change in my running style due to a blister back in January and found out by the stress of running hundreds of miles a week had effectively ended my chances of racing at the London Marathon. I was never going to run an Olympic qualification time. I'd known this for some time now. But the disappointment of having spent two years training for a race that I would never take part in was huge. In the end, only Dan Robinson qualified for Britain's Beijing Olympic marathon team, and in the time I've been making the documentary, British distance running had declined further. Despite not being able to race at the London Marathon, the journey had been an amazing experience, and it had a significantly positive impact on my life. I'd learned about my limitations as a runner, but also what could be achieved with hard work and by never giving up. I had experienced how difficult it could be to progress to an international standard, and having spent the last two years training as a marathon runner, I'd gained a far better understanding and respect for those British runners who had decided to dedicate their entire lives to the sport. What had started with a 16-stone filmmaker's journey to see if I had what it took to become an international marathon runner was about to become something far bigger. Ben and Mengistu both had a huge amount of natural talent that I had never had. But the question was, who would win in a race? Before the Bristol Half Marathon in September, I travelled back to Ethiopia with Ben to give him an insight into how the East African runners train and hopefully gain a successful visa for Mengistu. Maybe he's up already. Maybe. Mengistu, where have you been? Uh, <laughs> Should we go? Let's do it. Let's go, guys. a letter from um, an MP in England, uh -huh. uh, House of Commons, London. Uh, this is just one of them. God. There's another one, mm -hmm. another one from the government. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
five letters, all from Parliament. So hopefully, fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> It's crazy when you think we've both got completely different lifestyles, come from completely different places. Uh, Mengis has got his job of hotel bellboy, 14 hour shifts. I've got my job more, you know, just an office job, phones, email, computers. And yet we've got the same common aim of when can we fit in a run today, where can we go. So we have these sort of parallels in our lives across massive differences in culture. I mean, it's obvious how, how competitive it is here when there's just so many of them running. They're all, they all look like really good runners. They don't look like the joggers you see around London, perhaps, you know, just trying to lose weight or keep fit. They're proper, proper runners. And there's just loads of them, just hundreds of them. This, this is just one road. Think of all the other roads as well that they're running up and down. Must be, to get out of that and then to get to the elite level, the elite Ethiopian level must be so difficult. And must be what they're all striving for, but it must be so, so competitive and such hard work to get there. For Mengistu working 14 hour shifts at the hotel and his training partner Ashlan without work and sleeping on the streets, the chances of progressing through the ranks of Ethiopian athletics are depressingly low. For a lot of them, hope is uh, something that all of them are dreaming of. They hope of a better life or hoping of more opportunities in Ethiopia. And um, you mean, as soon as someone drives past the church, they're blessing themselves, whoever it is. And uh, it is a much bigger. Um, part of their lives here than it is in Britain where perhaps we are a little bit more sort of relaxed about life and that we've already got pretty much everything that we would aspire to and we don't have to you know hope that someone's going to bring us a miracle and take us away and give us a better life somewhere else. Finger cross Jesus for for Fingers crossed <laughs> Fatal coincidence, the final part of the documentary would now hinge on the outcome of Mengistu's visa application. Despite the overwhelming support for the visa, the chances of success were still slim. I had done everything possible, but still felt sick to the stomach waiting for the decision. Six months hard work. I'm just about to open the visa for Mengistu over here. Let's see if we can get into the UK. If it's not good, then we can't help, but if it's good, then it will be. Visa to me. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Congrats. <laughs> Coming to London, Mengi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, this makes me want to cry, Mengi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I can't believe yeah. it. <laughs> now I'm just going to book a flight. Yeah. <laughs> What do you think your chances are now of actually beating him? <laughs> well, it'll be on my, my home turf then, so uh, <laughs> see, we'll see. We're going to have to acclimatise the sea level, that's for sure. A half marathon? Half, half marathon? marathon? Me yeah. or you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's being polite. <laughs> Before heading back to the UK with Mengistu, I travelled to the northern city of Gondor to meet his family who he had not seen since leaving to work in Addis Ababa four years ago. For much of Mengistu's life, he had tended his father's cattle, but recently his family had fallen on hard times and been forced to move due to a government housing development. They had been offered modest compensation for their ancestral grazing lands and were now struggling to make ends meet. He's so glad. I've been thinking a while since they see each other. Hello. Hello. He's giving him an advice, telling him that he has to call to his family to let them know how he's doing and stay in a country which you are, you don't need to move place to place and so on. So they just 
kind of are serious to know about him. So, I mean, how he's doing thus far. <laughs> <laughs> the whole family are wishing that, I mean, they want to see him coming home, like, to be famous like the other runners of each other, and he just want a name in the world and, and so on. So every, all the, the whole family are wishing to him very good luck, and his dream come true, and everything. So all the best to him. There's no doubt he's got the ability. Racing is something that takes a while to get used to, so it depends. Depends how he uh, how he paces it, I think. I'm not, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say either way <laughs> it's a long race and it's bold to make uh, to make big strong moves early on but let's see Five, four. As Ben had predicted, Mengistu headed to the front of the field and was forcing the pace, trying to win the race early on. For Mengistu, the race meant everything. This might be his only opportunity to change the fortunes of his family. If he could win the race, then not only would he raise his profile back in Ethiopia and pick up a European agent, but he'd also be able to buy his family a new farm and provide for them for life. By two miles, Mengistu would open up a small lead at the front of the race. Here was a guy who six months earlier had carried my bags to my hotel room in Ethiopia, who through a strange twist of fate had found himself with the opportunity to race abroad. But by three miles, Mengistu had inexplicably dropped off the lead pack and bit by bit, a gap was beginning to grow between him and Ben. Ben looked relaxed and in control of the race, but Mengistu was not finished yet and was now finally coming back at him. But had he left his comeback too late? training my legs from the last couple of weeks. A bit of work to do, but I felt fit. Just uh, maybe not quite race fit yet. I think uh, next week I'm gonna feel a lot better and then I'll be able to push on and have a good run in Amsterdam, hopefully. I don't know what's up, whether he's just, yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Especially whether the whole race thing got to him or whether he's maybe not fully fit, I don't know, hard to say. But he didn't look right today, definitely. Not everyone has a brilliant race every time anyway, especially when it's your first proper race in a, 
in a foreign country as well. It's hard work, but maybe he just needs a few races before uh, before he reproduces what he can do in training. Some people are like that, so we'll see. Chris Bradfield, 87. No, good Andy. 87, Bobby. What happened, Mengi? <laughs> what happened? The first time. Last time. Yeah. The first time it will be hard you for him it? for everything, you know? Yeah, pretty nervous. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, you'll go pay for Former Ethiopian athlete Burhan Dagny had gone on to win the women's race in some style, but her first race had ended in failure. A few days later, I met up with Birhan to help unravel what had happened to Mengistu during the build-up to the race, and bit by bit, the uncomfortable truth came out. After I had left Ethiopia at the start of the year, his family had fallen on hard times, and as a sole source of family income, he had taken on extra shifts at the hotel. Having narrowly missed out on selection for one of the running clubs, and having been rejected a visa to travel to the UK, he had all but given up on his training. The day-to-day -day necessities of surviving Ethiopia had become his primary focus, and his training had suffered as a consequence. Despite Mengistu failing to live up to expectations during the race, he had still run a minute faster than I had achieved at the Amsterdam Half Marathon. Talent might have been no substitute for training, but I had also realised that training was no substitute for talent. Both Mengistu and I had failed to make the grade for very different reasons, but for Ben, who had been able to successfully combine both talent and training, the Amsterdam Marathon provided the perfect opportunity to demonstrate what it takes by running one of the fastest times of the year for a British runner. Ben certainly has the talent and the drive to be there at the start line come 2012. But as the gap continues to grow between the East African and Caucasian runners and with funding geared towards Olympic medal winning sports, the path that Ben and Britain's marathon runners will have to tread over the next four years will be a long and lonely one. There is the talent in the UK for British runners to once again compete with the East Africans. And with the 2012 London Olympics fast approaching, now is the perfect opportunity for the sport's governing bodies and the public to once again get behind Britain's male marathon runners. So what does it take to become an international distance runner? Having met some of the greatest distance runners of all time throughout my journey on this project, one trait stood out more than anything else. It did not matter what their background was, the colour of their skin or how much money they had. What united them was what motivated them to strive towards goals. The key to success is motivation. It's what gets you out of bed in the morning and what keeps you going when your body screams at you to quit. Find what motivates you, use it, and never look back. It might just change your life forever.